Today I want to talk about why women are so unhappy. This is a real thing, and if you read about this in the papers, you're most likely to read about it under the headline, The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. And I would put paradox in heavy scare quotes here, and you'll see why in just a second. But basically what this is based on, this 2009 paper by Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, uh, their uh, husband and wife or partner and partner team, whatever they would call themselves, I guess, and they have pointed out that since 1970, between 1970 and 1990, women in surveys, and as they sort of described themselves, became progressively less and less happy relative to men. And this is very perplexing to people who think that feminism has been an unqualified good because they look at this and they think, well, everything is going great, you know, or getting better rather for women, of course. You know, they're in the workplace more and more. They're getting paid more and more. There, there are more female CEOs. There are, you know, all of these sort of victories that feminism has won during that time, which are supposed to be an unqualified good. Suddenly there's this paradox, the paradox of declining female happiness. Why aren't women getting happier as feminism? makes more and more gains, especially what we call second wave and third wave feminism, these sort of uh, post, you know, voting rights feminism after after women win the vote in 1920 in America. Um, we have sort of a period then of, of focusing on like economic stuff and you get the um, Equal Pay Act in 1963. And then we really move into hardcore like second wave feminism, women's rights in the workplace, women's rights, uh, even, you know, it, women's rights to have equal work in the home, all of this stuff. And as feminism becomes more and more prominent in the West and in America, women seem to get less and less happy. Here is one reading of this from The Guardian. This is an article about the, the paper that I just cited, and, and they're puzzling over what, how could it be that, you know, women are working all the time? How could it be that they're less happy? Why is this? I'm quoting now from The Guardian. Evidence supports the idea that women's rights and roles in the home in the U.S. and Europe have not moved in step with changes in the workplace. She's saying that in the workplace, women are having more rights, more success, um, but in the home, they're still oppressed. Why? Uh, because women with jobs often do most of the chores and childcare, they shoulder a dual burden that cuts into their sleep and fun. Long commutes are thought to make British women more miserable than British men because of the greater pressure on women to meet responsibilities at home as well as at work. Now, far be it from me to suggest that men shouldn't help out around the house. They should. Honeydew lists are a thing, of course. But there is something seriously wrong here, something seriously missing from this account of what women want out of life and what would fulfill women. It's sort of like, oh, you know, it, it's so great that women have made all these advances so they can go to work all the time, but they're still held back by that pesky child care, right? If only we could get men to, you know, take on more of the childbearing and maybe even if we could have men, you know, do the getting pregnant and do the giving birth, then women would be free to really self-actualize, to truly become the girl boss CEOs that they long to be. Now, this is part of a two-part series that I've been doing on Christine de Paisan and what I've been calling the kind of pro-woman vision of what it means to be a woman. I've been arguing that something is really lacking from this feminist idea that women ought to be getting more and more like men. That the more equal, quote-unquote, women get, the more similar they will become to men. And if you peel this back even further, if you go deeper than just the sort of uh, headline paradox of women's happiness, how can this be? Uh, the picture gets even even bleaker, right? That uh, you you read in the I'm reading now from the Spectator. James Kirkup writes: This is not a good time to be a girl. Research from Steer Education last month showed that far too many girls are sad and anxious and concealing their troubles from others. In 2019, the Lancet published research showing girls' rates of self harm had tripled since. 2000. Other studies show girls are much more likely to be depressed or anxious than boys. I think girls are, uh, women are twice as likely to be on antidepressants as men. Something is going terribly wrong with our vision of 
womanhood. And so I put, I point this out to you as a way of returning once again to Christine de Paisan, this medieval French woman who knows so much more about how to celebrate women and what women are than either our radical left and our sort of pro-feminist uh, wing, which has no idea why women wouldn't be happy, you know, going to work all the time versus uh, on the other hand, I think Christine also knows a little bit more than some of our conservative friends who pound the table and say, yes, women should be, you know, they should be demure and and they should be the angels in the house, right? This kind of Victorian idea um, of just, you know, hiding away and shrinking and, and never being seen or heard. Um, and I'm exaggerating, but I think that the right does this in order to counter act the left, right? We sort of get into this weird reactive position where we're emphasizing the girliest and most feminine parts of womanhood because the left is trying to erase those parts. And what I love about Christine de Paisan, the reason I'm, I'm reading to you from her works here is because uh, she doesn't care about any of that, right? She's not living in, in 2022. So she doesn't care about the rights pieties or the left piety. She's just trying to say, women are one half of creation. They are in the image of God. They are, uh, you know, a, a central part of the world. What are they like? What, what makes them virtuous? What makes them good? And how can they be the best that they are? So I've been reading to you from the book of the city of ladies. And in a second, I'm going to read to you one more quote from that book before we move on to uh, uh, her second book, which is the book of the treasure of the city of ladies. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a sequel and a manual for being a virtuous woman. Um, but let me first read to you from the book of the city of ladies, just so that I can show you how different Christine is from our modern feminists. One of the problems with digital tech and modern life is that we don't always get to cherish our memories in the same way. But paint your life is the solution to this problem. I have this cat that I love, Chad Cat. And one of the things I noticed, we were taking all these pictures of him as he was growing up, but they all just kind of lived like on our phones um, and they never really had any tangible presence in our lives. But Paint Your Life fixes that problem. What you do is you send them a picture from your phone or anything that you cherish. Maybe it's a, you know, a vacation that you took or somebody that's not with you anymore. Maybe it's something from your wedding, right? Um, and, and they will take it and give it to a professional artist who will work with you to create an original painting based on your photograph. I've got one in my studio uh, of Chad Cat when he was a little kitten that my producers got for me. But you can do this with anything, you know. I think we'll probably do it uh, with our wedding coming up. Uh, and right now, for Young Heretics listeners, there is a special offer. Um, there's no risk to this. If you don't love your painting, your money is refunded. And you get 20% off when you text the word Heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, to the number 64,000. One more time, it's Heretics, Text it to 64,000 to get 20% off. Celebrate the moments that matter most with Paint Your Life. Message and data rates may apply and terms apply. They are available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. One more time, text heretics to 64,000 to get 20% off your own personalized painting. So remember, this is a uh, woman who originates in, in, she was born in Venice, but she uh, becomes famous and, and prominent in France. And she's writing in French. And this is a translation by Sophie Borgol, uh, or Borgolt, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and Rebecca Kingston. This is about women's bodies. Remember, we were talking about uh, how earlier women were, were accused of being just, you know, weak in, in medieval and classical literature, right? That they're just weak. And so they must be a kind of defective men or, or God must have made a mistake um, in making them. And so Christine is having this back and forth with, with Lady Reason, Lady Rectitude, and Lady Justice, uh, these sort of personifications about, you know, who are telling, setting her straight and telling her the truth about women. And she says, Christine says, Lady, I remember that at the end of his detailed discussion about the inadequacy and weakness of the way the female body is formed in the mother's womb, an author says that nature is also deeply ashamed when she sees that she has created such an imperfect body. Oh, my dear friend, replies Lady Reason, you must see the complete madness, the irrational blindness that prompted these words. How could nature, God's handmaiden, be more powerful than her master, the almighty God, who conceived the form of man and woman after his own image and from whom she derives her authority? It was his holy wish to fashion Adam from the clay of the field of Damascus, and when he had created him, he took him to dwell in the earthly paradise, the noblest place on this lowly earth. There he put Adam to sleep and created woman from one of his ribs. 
That means that she was meant to stand beside him and not lie at his feet like a servant, and that he should love her like his own flesh. If the divine craftsman was not ashamed of the creation and shape of the female body, why would nature be? Ah, it is the height of folly to say that. Indeed, how was she formed? I don't know if you've thought of this. She was created in the image of God. How can anyone dare slander the vessel that bears such a noble imprint? But when some people hear that God created man in his image, they are foolish enough to believe that this refers to his material body. That is incorrect, however, for God had not assumed a human shape at that time. In fact, it refers to the soul, the intellectual spirit that will last to eternity in God's image. God created this soul and put equally good and noble souls in the bodies of men and women. But to return to the creation of the body, woman was made by the divine craftsman. And where was she created? In the earthly paradise. And from what? Was it a vile material? On the contrary, it was from the noblest material ever created, the body of man, that God made woman. It's a beautiful passage, and it's rich with Christ Christine's devoted Christianity, and we've been emphasizing that as a way it, into understanding why Christine can endorse women fully, including in some of their weaknesses, according to the world, right? The world sees that women can be more emotionally volatile, and it despises that. The world sees that women can be physically weak, and, you know, the, the powers of the world despise that. But Christianity, and Christine's Christianity, lifts that up and says, weeping over the world is an important part of understanding the world, and women contribute their so-called weakness to the complete picture of the world that humanity is supposed to draw. And women's bodies, says Christine, are part of that. We are embodied souls, all of us. And this body which has the power to create life, this female form, is something of which God is not ashamed. Let me compare that now to a guidance, a gender-inclusive language policy uh, at Britain's National Health Service at Brighton and Sussex University Hospitals. Um, these are midwives I have been instructed not long ago to speak about women's bodies in the following way. Maternity departments are now to be known as perinatal services. The word mother is to be replaced with the phrase mother or birthing parent. Breastfeeding is to be known as chest feeding. Breast milk should be called human milk or breast slash chest milk or milk from the feeding mother or parent. The word woman should be replaced with the phrase woman or person. Fathers should be referred to as the parent, co-parent, or second biological parent. You'll probably recognize some of this language because it has been all the rage in our uh, sort of so-called elite circles of high culture. We saw the New York Times start using the word menstruator to describe women. And when talking about periods, we've seen chest feeding all over the place. We've seen even something so so vile as front hole um, to describe the female genitalia. This is all a way of talking about women that has become popular in late stage feminism, in third and even fourth wave feminism, uh, which effectively erases the uniqueness of women's bodies and women's selves. We are not the same as our bodies, but our bodies say something about us. We are, as I said, embodied souls. And when Christine says that God is not ashamed of the female body for its weakness, she means that God is not ashamed of the entirety of the female person. He says created in the image of God means the soul. The soul is in this body and, and whatever it is, right, the fullness of its, of its healthy form must be an expression of the divine. And we have completely lost that in, in our sort of modern debates about what women are and should be. This is why we talk about, you know, chest feeding and why we talk about, you know, men can get pregnant and all of this stuff. It's because if you start out by saying that women need to have all the same achievements as men, right, and all the same pay for all the same, you need to have 50-50 uh, distribution of men and women in every area of life. Um, this is Susan Oaken, another feminist, talks about this. We would want women and men to be doing 50-50 of the work everywhere in all contexts. But if you start out with that, of course, what you're going to end up doing is shoving women towards being more and more manly and ignoring more and more of their unique nature as women, right? S stripping away this kind of pro-woman uh, idea that is in Christine. And eventually you're going to just get to the abolition of gender and the abolition of women 
altogether. So that's what this is about. It's about the abolition of women because women in the eyes of late stage feminism are weak and small and disgusting, just like they were in the eyes of the misogynists that Christine was talking about. So that's why we're returning to Christine. Last week, I told you a little bit about some of her, Christine's own girl bossery, right? She has a certain tendency uh, to do this thing where, where she sort of sometimes sounds like women can be as good as men, except better all the time, right? She talks about these strong Amazons who fought on the field. She talks about Artemisia. She talks about these famous examples from classical literature where, you know, women kind of excel in, in extraordinary ways beyond what they're typically expected of being capable of. And it's easy from our modern perspective to read that and think, well, Christine is just another crusader for, for girl bossery, essentially. But I was drawing out at the same time that while she's talking about these sort of extraordinary examples, she's also doing something, in my opinion, more important and more interesting. And that is drawing on stories from antiquity and from the past where women play an important role as women, right? And showing how the wisdom of those stories is in the womanliness of the women. I, I gave the example of the, the Sabine women. Remember this story that when Rome was getting started in order to basically populate the city, the legend goes that the Roman men carried off these women from a neighboring uh, civilization, from the Sabine, the Sabine women. And there was war then between the Sabines and the Romans until the women themselves stepped forward because on the one side of this war were their husbands, their new husbands, and on the other side of this war were their fathers. And they simply said, you know, they, they intervened and wept on behalf of the deaths of all their beloved men, right? And that weeping was itself this kind of shocking political action because the weeping in response to the situation showed the men something about it. They were so wrapped up in their war that the women, the Sabine women had something to show them and contribute, which was that this was now a senseless war and there was no going back. And the wisdom of that was in the so-called weakness, or rather you might say the emotional intuitions of the women involved, right? So there's an example of what Christine is doing with, you know, how women as women can also be super important. And I want to now follow that up by reading to you from the book of the treasure of the city of ladies. This is the second book that Christine writes on this subject. It's shorter. And what's interesting about it is that it's about women in sort of daily life. And especially, you know, she's in writing around the turn of the 15th century throughout the, the 14th and 15th centuries um, AD. And what she's doing is she's basically trying to talk now in this book about how women in her life and in her sort of milieu and context ought to live. It's all about the virtues and the treasure of the city of women is the virtue because the city of women is where the, you know, the, the most famous and, and blessed women live throughout all time. And the virtues are the treasure because when you seek virtue, even if things go badly for you on this earth, nevertheless, you gain sort of uh, heavenly, heavenly rewards. That's the idea. And this is a really important book because it shows that for daily life, for most women, Christine is actually very girly. She's, she's focusing on these demure, self-effacing, chaste, humble, warm attributes uh, and virtues that women should pursue. Again, as women, not because they shouldn't have any influence or role in politics. She doesn't think that. Not because they shouldn't even be interested in economics and do work, right? We talked about the Proverbs 31 woman and this old, longstanding ideal that women actually should should have a lot of financial savvy, but that they execute it in different spheres and generally are going to want to excel in those uh, homemaking related spheres. They're even going to want to do work differently. We talked about how women are are finding a greater work life balance from the kind of work from home COVID thing, contrary to uh, some of the feminist stuff you might have heard. But this treasure of the city of, of women basically shows you that Christine wants to say, you know, yeah, women are capable of all sorts of extraordinary things. But in essence, right, the core of things is that they have this unique and specific role to play in human life. And this is something that we also get wrong all the time in our modern debates. We we have a left that says, essentially, here's an exception to the rule, and therefore the rule is garbage. And you see this all the time, right? Well, here's, you know, one person who feels out of place in his body. And that must mean that gender doesn't exist, right? Rather than saying, well, here's a small percentage of the population that 
is the exception that proves the rule, right? And so here too, you know, Christine is saying there are some exceptional women basically in every sphere, but that doesn't mean that women are all sort of called to be as manly as they possibly can be. In fact, most women are going to thrive and succeed in, in womanly virtues. So I'm going to read to you now a little bit about some of these virtues, the foremost of which is chastity. And this is something Christine thinks everybody should have. Nobody should sleep around in Christine's view. But she does focus on chastity all the time and not because it'll, you know, be inconvenient to have extramarital affairs, but because chastity is itself a treasure. So here's here's the treasure of the city of women. I'm reading now from a different translation. This is Sarah Lawson uh, in the Penguin Classics edition. And she sort of moves in this book through the different social classes. That's one of the interesting things about it. She starts with a princess and then talks about the people, the women that sort of take care of or, or wait on the princess and how they should help cultivate her virtue. And then she moves out into the world and the wives of merchants and, you know, the, the, all the way down in the end to prostitutes. So we'll get there. But we're talking, first of all, about a princess, though it applies to others. She says, in all her gaiety and pastimes, it will become her to preserve all moderation and modesty. She should say to her serving women and serving girls, or to others according to the occasion, virtuous and exemplary words, so that those men and women who hear them will say that this speech issues from a very good, wise, and chaste lady. Sobriety will keep her from speaking to her women and servants ungraciously, or scolding, or saying base things. She will teach them kindly and correct their faults courteously warning them that she may dismiss them or punish them in some way if they do not improve. However, her speech will always be calm and without coarseness, because when coarseness issues from the mouth of a lady or of any woman, it rebounds more on herself than on those to whom she says it. She will make her commands reasonable in place and in time, and to those whose business it is, each in his own duties. This lady will gladly read instructive books about good manners and behavior and sometimes devotion, but those about indecency and lubricity she will utterly hate and not wish to have at her court. She will not permit them to be brought into the presence of any girl, female relative, or woman in her court, for there is no doubt at all that the examples of good or evil influence the mind of those men or women who see or hear them. And so this noble lady takes pleasure in recording and saying good words and especially the word of God for the godly woman will hear his word eagerly in the manner that he describes in the gospel, where he says, those who love me hear my word willingly and keep it. Of worldly affairs, she will gladly hear about worthwhile people, worthy knights and gentlemen, their deeds and their exploits, great clergymen and their knowledge, all upright men and all worthy women, their intelligence and their good lives. She will love them and welcome them warmly. She will do them great honor and give them handsome gifts. Now, Note that a central aspect of sort of and runs throughout this book of of womanhood here is is a kind of self-restraint. And one of the things that the Internet does to us, I think, is it gets us thinking always in these kind of caricatures. We, we sort of everything gets dialed up to 11. And so when we talk about, you know, women being demure and uh, sort of self-controlled or when we talk about women being humble, all of these things get translated then into these images of like this super giggly, silly, you know, airheaded girl. And, you know, maybe there's something kind of appealing to men in that. But Christine actually has something different in mind here. She has a kind of sobriety in mind. She knows that, you know, everybody has nasty urges and things that like you, you would never want to admit in public that you want to do. And she's basically saying to keep this tight control on the uh, on, on the love of your excellence, essentially, that you, you shouldn't be just sort of able to, you know, be set off at any given moment. You shouldn't be giggly. You shouldn't be, you know, over the top. But she does say that, you know, women ought to have a have a care essentially for the environment in which they and those around them grow up and and live their lives is the example of others right the way that you look and think at things uh the way that you watch other people shapes your soul and and so you need to keep a guard on your especially on your chastity not because again not because like you might get pregnant out of wedlock and that would be inconvenient and not because you shouldn't be bound down to any man who could blackmail you but simply because chastity in itself is a good right she's about nobility here and excellence and this is one of the reasons again why it pays to go back to medieval texts and even earlier because they have these values about things that don't have to do with sort of utilitarian arguments well you're going to get this or that if you do it right 
right? That's sort of the lowest kind of argument. And that's the kind of argument we're used to making. Like, why should women, you know, be be chased? Well, because they might get a venereal disease or something. But it's like, it's not about that. It's the venereal disease is the effect, the kind of outworking or the outward show of something more inward and that, that has to do with the soul, right? And so constantly, Christine is talking about outward expressions of spiritual virtues here. And here's a, a passage now about uh, the sort of people who take care of princesses that kind of drives this idea forward. He says, what if a noble woman attracts attention in the court from a dashing young fellow, right? This is like, you know, now that nowadays all of our sort of period dramas are about this, right? Isn't it exciting when you have an extramarital affair in, in court? And Christine is absolutely severe about this. Of course, she says like, do not let this happen. And uh, here's how, here's how to shut a dude down uh, when he comes at you with an improper advance in case you've ever been wondering. You guys, we have a new sponsor. I'm very excited about these guys. I use their product all the time. It's Theragun. This is the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combo of depth, speed, and power. And it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush. This stuff is great. You guys know that I love weightlifting. Um, I, I started using Theragun to help with aches from weightlifting, and now I can't get enough of it. It really does help relax me, um, especially if there's a particular area of tension. It's really easy to apply this sort of um, this this pressure to, to just relax some of the aches and pains that you get. Um, they're trusted by 250 professional sports teams like Real Madrid and elite athletes like Paul George, DeAndre Hopkins, Maria Sharapova, and hundreds of thousands of customers, and me, somebody who is not at all an elite athlete, um, but who does need to, you know, get over some, some aches and pains from lifting weights. Right now, for Young Heretics listeners, you can try Theragun for 30 days, starting at only $199. Go to therabody.com slash heretics right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's therabody.com slash heretics, therabody.com slash heretics. Heretics. Really excited that they're sponsoring us. I love their stuff. I've been using it for a while now. Uh, go to therabody.com slash heretics for your special offer. So we're talking here about how the attendant of a lady will take the rapscallion, the scoundrel aside and tell him that ain't gonna happen, bro. She will say to him, sir, truly it has not escaped my notice by your manner that you have had in mind what you have told me. But I wanted the words to come from you. So she convinces him basically to admit uh, that he's he's got sex on the brain. He says, first, I desired to have this acquaintance with you so that you could tell me about it and I might know it before anyone else who might report the thing and reveal the secret. I am quite pleased that I now have the chance to make you this reply about what you have told me as it reflects my firm resolve upon which upon my life I promise to God and to you will never change. Without making you a very long sermon about this or going on at too great length, I tell you quite briefly and once and for all that so long as I am living and in her company, this young lady, who by the confidence that her friends and her Lord have in me, although I am unworthy of so much, is entrusted to my care, will do no wrong, nor will she do anything that would give rise to reproaches or any talk other than what is proper about a lady like her of noble blood from whom she is descended. With the help of God, I certainly intend to prevent it. Although her virtue is easy to protect, for I know quite well that all her love is reserved for her husband, just as it ought to be. I know that she is altogether good and of a high moral character, and that she would not have anything to do with an illicit love affair, nor even think of it. And I know her so well that if you or anyone else said anything to her, or if she noticed something, I know she would hate above all else the man who she thought had in mind any such thing in regard to her. So there's a degree of, of severity here, right? But this is a woman taking care of business in a womanly way, discreetly, without betraying anybody on, you know, on her side, and, and basically just sort of pulling this man aside and slapping him around. Um, and there's, of course, a crucial role for the, the woman that knows how to slap a dude around at the right time. Right? I mean, I'm not talking physically here, but I, I am saying that there's in, in the tradition of thinking about womanhood and not just in Christine de Paisan, but even in, you know, in Boccaccio, whom she's often uh, referring to here and in earlier stuff like Plutarch. Um, there's this idea that part, you know, women and men need each other. 
We were made for each other. And part of the role of women in life, and not just in marriage either, is to buck men up and remind them of themselves because men can be dogs. Of course we know this. Of course, you know, every each sex has its excesses. Uh, one of the excesses of manhood is excessive horniness, and women completely lose their mind, or rather men completely lose their minds over this. It's called thinking with the wrong organ, if you get my drift. And women's job in this case is to be the moral center of the universe and to, to kind of uh, the, 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 ec the exertion of female chastity, uh, which is, you know, kind of a development that it takes that takes Western civilization and the church to, to gain the power that it deserves, right? Because of course, you know, if you're in a state of nature or if you're just in a warlord society, then men can sort of take whatever they want. Um, but as the church grows and teaches these morals to people, right, women's chastity becomes an incredibly important bulwark against complete moral disaster. Because as I said, men can be dogs. And this is a guard against the excesses of male sexuality is this female sobriety. Right. And it's not to say that, you know, women can't do stupid things out of sexual desire or anything like that. Of course, you know, we all fall short. We all are can be a mess. Um, but women generally are able with practice and training and with good instruction to keep their heads um, in love affairs and in, in at least in, in sexual love. Right. And in emotional love, it's a little bit different. Right. Men kind of have more of the uh, guiding role there because they are less prone to the excesses of emotion. But with the excesses of sex. Right. Women's chastity is not just there to keep women down. It's not just there to stop women from, you know, getting pregnant out of wedlock. It's there to protect women from the ravages of of men, right, from the ravages of the worst of men. And in turn, see how this works, right? In turn, by protecting women through chastity from the ravages of men, chastity also ennobles men, right? And leads them to a higher, truer self that they didn't maybe know they had until women put their foot down and said, absolutely not. Never in, on my life is there going to be any funny business here. So get that out of your mind, bro. And don't even ever text her about it again. Uh, delete her Tinder. Like, you know, go, <laughs> go pound sand. This is a, a, a crucial element of the dynamic between men and women. And, and we think of it now as so easy, right? Well, of course, you know, people are in charge of their, you you know, women are in charge of their own bodies and, you know, men should should take no as an answer. But this was something that had to be developed over long uh, effort. And this is why we started out by talking about chivalry. And now we're talking about womanly virtue, right? Because chivalry is the corresponding male virtue that hears the no and hears it mean no, right? We, we read a ridiculous article last week in which somebody said that chivalry is a protection racket because it requires men to protect women from other men. But that's nonsense because that's simply an acknowledgement of the way the world is, right? Men can be terrible and chivalry teaches men not to be terrible and, and women, womanly virtue and restraint treat, teaches women, right, not to succumb to men's terribleness. And in the interaction between these two things, between chivalry and womanly virtue, you get the entire world. Right. This is what civilization is built upon is women being women and men being men with the virtues that were taught to them of old by the Christian church. If you sweep all of this away, you're not going to like what you get. Right. And this is why women are so unhappy. This is what I began with at, you know, this week. Right. Why are women so unhappy? Well, these things exist for a reason and it's not to oppress people. I know that, of course, you know, as societies change, rules change and technology changes things, too. We're going to get into that in a little bit as well. So it's not as if, you know, the all the rules about everything need to stay static. We ought to just go back to the way society was built in Christine de Paisan's era and, you know, the make laws basically medieval. Like, I'm, I'm not advocating that. Nobody's advocating for that. What I'm suggesting is that these ideals and virtues, which are built out of the nature of manhood and womanhood, in their best self, right? They're built out of shaping the raw material of how we are as broken individuals who are nevertheless made by God, shaping that material into something high and true and beautiful that can be in the image of God, right? And so <laughs> if, you, if you take centuries and you develop customs and you develop roles for people in society that depend on their nature, and then you sweep all of that away in the matter of less than a hundred years, chances are good that neither women nor men are going to like the result very much. Let me talk now a little bit more about this idea that 
oh, you know, conservatives all just want women in the home. Because like I said, I do think that the right can sometimes talk in an over the top way about this because they're reacting to the kind of abolition of women. Um, but there is a, this sort of ridiculous idea that what conservatives want is for women to wear veils all the time and never leave their house and so on and so forth. And again, Christine is a perfect antidote to this because as we've seen, right, she's, she, she's very womanly. She advocates womanly virtues. And yet she does not think that this means that women have no role to play in like the quote unquote manly areas of life. She just thinks that they work in a different sort of way. So let, let's get into that. So this is back to the princess now, right? The kind of noble woman. Uh, and what happens if somebody wishes to go to war in on the noble woman's watch? She says, if any neighboring or foreign prince wishes for any reason to make war against her husband, or if her husband wishes to make war on someone else, the good lady will consider this thing carefully, bearing in mind the great evils and infinite cruelties, destruction, massacres, and detriment to the country that result from war. The outcome is often terrible. She will ponder long and hard whether she can do something, always preserving the honor of her husband to prevent this war. In this cause, she will wish to work and labor carefully, calling God to her aid, and by good counsel, she will do whatever she can to find a way of peace. Or perhaps some one of the princes of the kingdom or one of the barons or knights or powerful subjects commits some crime, even against the majesty of his lord, or is to blame for it, and she sees that if he is captured and punished or warred against great evil can come to the land. Similar cases have often been seen in France and other places in episodes involving quite an insignificant baron or knight compared to the king of France, who is a great prince, whence have come many great evils and many much harm to the kingdom, as the chronicles of France relate of the Count of Corbet, the Lord of Montsieri, and several others. And it even happened not long ago that my Lord Robert d'Artois, by his dispute with the king, greatly harmed the kingdom of France, the benefit of the English. She's talking about contemporary struggles, right? And so she's saying, what should women do about this? Since the good lady will bear these things in mind and feel pity for the destruction of the people, she will wish to work to make peace. She will urge her husband, the prince, and his council to consider this matter carefully before undertaking it in light of the evil which could result from it. Any prince ought to avoid as far as he can the spilling of blood, especially that of his own subjects. It is no small matter to undertake a new war, and it ought not to be done without deep reflection and serious deliberation. It would be much better to think of some more suitable way to reach agreement. This lady will not hesitate for a moment, but will speak or have someone else speak, preserving her honor and that of her husband, to the one or ones who have committed the misdeed. She will reproach them for it sharply saying that the misdeed was very serious and that the prince is quite justifiably offended by it and that she has decided to avenge himself for it as his only right. But nevertheless, she, who would always wish the blessing of peace in the event that they would wish to atone for it or make suitable amends, would gladly go to some trouble to try if she could, by some means, to make peace between them and her husband. Note how sophisticated and civilized this is. It's very delicate. And think back also to Ho to Hector, right, in, in Homer's Iliad, Hector and Andromache on the wall before Hector has to go off to his death, right? And Andromache is pleading with him not to go. Think of your child. Think of what will happen to me if the city is conquered. You have to stay here. I have this terrible premonition, right? Here is kind of the civil civilized and sophisticated uh, and interpersonal version of that dynamic. And remember that Christine was on Andromache's side there. And I was not, right? I think that ultimately in that story, Hector has to go out and fight because there's, you know, the city's going to fall either way. And in that case, manly nobility is the, th is the only way to, to push forward. But Christine is acknowledging here that women and men both have a role to play in conflicts, right? She says it's only right for a man to want to avenge his honor, to want to, you know, go to war over an insult. All of these things are in, in the letter of justice. But women are peacemakers because they inherently feel the, the pains of war, right? Again, this is this idea that, you know, oh, women are more emotional. And Christine says, yeah, because the world is an incredibly terrible and sorrowful place. And by feeling those sorrows, women connect men to the reality of the world. And so she says, women have pity on the people that die in war. They don't want to see it. And they uh, feel a desire to make peace if they can. And they use their interpersonal skills to do this, right? By, by sort of talking in private to the injured parties or the injuring parties. And they try essentially 
to, uh, you know, make some sort of resolution, some peaceful sort of resolution. And Christine, I think, is acknowledging in this passage that you need both sides of these things, right? You need the man that recognizes what justice is and ultimately in the end is going to do justice if he doesn't get some sort of retribution. But the woman softens this, right? And it enables it, enables him to think, see his way past the madness, right? Past his rage um, and, and past the just, you know, willingness to get victory at all costs. If you want a modern day example of how this works, go and listen to the Red Scare podcast. This is a funny recommendation. If you haven't checked these people out already, you might get a kick out of them. Uh, They put some of their episodes behind a paywall, but some of them are free. And it's just these two ladies, kind of neo-Marxists, uh, post-leftist ladies. They're part of what's sometimes called the dirtbag left, which is like the anti-culture, cancel culture left. So they're they're lefties in some ways, but they're just also, you know, sensible people that don't want to devolve into weird gender, transgender madness. And they, they you know, they, they have dirty mouths and they'll say whatever they want. And so it's a, it's a great podcast in general. But their episode recently on Ukraine was interesting uh, because it was very girly. It was just like, it was, it was like, I don't know how to resolve the geopolitical situations here, but I just want peace, right? And that spirit is an important thing to listen to because it reminds you when, when men are all LARPing, right? LARPing like live action role playing about how we're going to roll in, we're going to create a no fly zone and we're going to put it, stick it to Putin. We're going to post the flag on our Instagram. Like when men are kind of getting into these fantasies of war, uh, as we're seeing now, women are more inclined, I think, to be uh, conscious of the women, womanly women are more inclined to be conscious of the realities of war and, and, and the, you know, emotional toll that it takes. They, they, you know, this is not something that you can listen to all the time, of course, right? You do not want a hyper feminized society any more than you want a hyper masculinized society. Sometimes you do have to go to war. Sometimes you have to face the terrors and the horrors of the world like Hector did. Um, but, but, it pays to listen to women because they're they're actually in some ways being realists about the sorrows that the broken world can inflict upon us. Um, and so this this Red Scare episode that I'm thinking of, I forget what it's called, but it's the one on Ukraine. Um, it's just about how they were crying and praying. There's just crying and praying, which is a good kind of it's like straight out of Christine de Paisan, right? It's just women have this role of crying and praying. Um, and that's actually central to human society. So. What about everybody else, right? We've talked about princesses. We've talked about noble women. Now she's going to turn, Christine's going to turn her attention to the rest of the world. And of course, she thinks that virtues are universal. But it's interesting that she cares to think about, you know, well, how do you live these things out if you're a merchant's wife or if you're a, uh, you know, if you're just a poor person or if you're, if you have religious orders or whatever. So first she says, all virtues are universal. Here's, here's the section where she does that. She says, we say to you, that although you are quite familiar with the lessons of your statutes and rules, this is talking now to women who have taken religious orders. So she's kind of making a survey of all the different kinds of women. She says, although you are quite familiar with the lessons of your statutes and rules to maintain the institutions established by your founders, we hope it may not be a hardship for you to hear us repeat, if it is agreeable to you, the principal virtues that are essential for you to have. There are seven particular ones to wit. The first, obedience, on which every religious order is based. The second, humility, the third, sobriety, the fourth, patience, the fifth, solicitude, the sixth, chastity, the seventh, concord and benevolence. Although our words are addressed to those among you in religious orders, it ought to be understood that all women can equally well lend an ear to them and take away whatever they can profitably apply to themselves. And also, if any jot or tittle of this can find its way to men, please do not scorn it and throw it to one side. For good precepts can be compared to the good and loyal friend who, when he cannot help, at least does no harm. In nature, there is no war between the sexes and virtue is universal, right? She's listing these, you know, obedience, patience, chastity, these these religious virtues. She's saying this applies specifically to some people in specific roles in society, but also to all women, right? These are kind of womanly virtues for everybody. And indeed, even men can benefit from thinking about them. Um, There are passages even in C.S. Lewis, where he talks about heaven being transsexual, which is an amazing thing for him to say, because of course, he does not mean by that what we now mean, which is like, you know, chopping off genitalia and taking hormones. Um, But he means that 
we, we have an impoverished vision of ourselves if we think of ourselves as only able to pursue the virtues that belong to our sex. And of course, you know, men should pay more attention to the manly virtues, women should pay more attention to the womanly virtues, but it doesn't mean that if you're a man, you can't think about like, of course, women, you know, women are sort of in charge of chastity in Christine's vision, but that doesn't mean that men shouldn't be chaste, right? Men should take a cue from, from women in this, just as women must sometimes take a cue from men and be a little bit more hard nosed and, and dispassionately rational, right? Um, there is no war between the sexes, not in Christine's world and not in the real world. So we continue on this survey of all the different kinds of women that there are, um, and we end up eventually at prostitutes. And I wanted to spend some time on this because it's a particularly interesting part of the book, and it also speaks to something that is still with us today. Prostitution, the oldest profession, right? A central part, of course, of the Gospels is, you know, prostitutes being called to go and sin no more. They come and repent before Christ. And he says, look, the prostitutes and sinners get into the kingdom of heaven before you do. And so Christine, as a devout Christian, does have a concern for prostitutes who are kind of in her society, the lowest of the low right there. The, you know, once she's making her way down the social ladder, she's going to get to the very bottom and she doesn't flinch from it. So let's let's read now what she says about the oldest profession. I have been getting some awesome feedback about Gold River Trading Company. They really do make pr quality product. It's excellent tea, which is hard to find in the U.S. As somebody who spent a lot of time in the U.K., you get to like tea. Uh, tea is an extremely civilized drink. It gets a bad rap sometimes in America uh, because, first of all, we're not often very good at making it. <laughs> and second of all, there's the history of the Boston Tea Party and all of that stuff. But tea is an important part of all sorts of great American stories. The founders drank it. Um, it's, it's a great way to start your day or just to kind of get a pick me up in the middle of the day. I love the Gold River Trading Company green tea and chamomile tea as well. So if, you, if you're not into caffeine, chamomile is really good. But they also have 1776 American breakfast tea, which is just top notch. And like I said, it can be very difficult to get this kind of stuff in America. But this is an American company. They make fantastic tea. And if you are a Young Heretics listener, you can get 10% off when you use the promo code heretics at goldriverco.com. One more time, you go to goldriverco.com and you use the offer code heretics to get 10% off. Don't be a schlub, start drinking tea and check out Gold River Trading Company. Uh, use the promo code heretics for 10% off. Here is Christine addressing prostitutes and not indeed mincing words. She says, you thus sunk in sin. How can a woman degenerate into such vice who by her nature and upbringing is decent, mild and modest? How can she tolerate indecency in living, drinking and eating entirely among men more vile than swine, men who strike her, drag her about and threaten her, and by whom she is always in danger of being killed? Alas, why have womanly mildness and decency degenerated in you to such low and vulgar behavior? Oh, in the name of God, you women who bear the name of Christianity and who pervert it in such foul pursuits, raise yourselves, arise from this abominable mud, and refuse to allow your poor souls to be loaded down with filth committed by your lowly bodies. And all pitying God is prepared to receive you mercifully if you want to repent and ask contritely for mercy. Take as your example the blessed Mary of Egypt, who repented of her misguided life and turned to God and is a glorious saint in paradise. Likewise, the blessed Saint Aphra, who offered her body with which she had sinned to martyrdom for the love of our Lord and others similarly who have been saved. Some of you may wish to excuse yourselves, saying that you would gladly do it, but three reasons hinder you. First, because your disreputable customers would not let you. Second, that the world in revulsion would reject you and ostracize you. And for that reason, you would be so ashamed that you would never dare to be seen among ordinary people. Third, that you would not have a way of making a living, for you do not know a trade. Now, just like the other stuff, all of this applies not just to prostitutes, but to anyone who feels that they have fallen short and they somehow can't help it, right? They, you know, I can't get out of my parents' house because I just don't, you know, the, the economic circumstances just don't allow it. Or I just, you know, I can't get out of bed because I'm just, you know, my, I'm chemically depressed. And of course, you know, there are, all of these things need compassion. You may need to reach out for help, right? But Christine is talking here into a world, right, that she, she refuses to excuse the ugliness of the world just because the world is broken. And she says, you might say, well, you know, this is uh, something that I have to do for economic reasons. She's saying there is always a way out. 
And crucially, saying that, her ability to say that, depends on this Christian idea, right? And if, on a Christian society that creates that first of all does not view prostitution as a good thing, right? There can't be any, you know, destigmatized sex work in this. And Christine shows what a what a horrible idea that is, of course, because she says, you know, this is a, a life that involves being among men who would, you know, traffic and kill you. Um, if you if you watch videos put out by Exodus Cry, which is a sort of advocacy network for this kind of thing. You see the terrible stuff that happens now still today, even to people who aren't prostitutes, but who have just been hoodwinked into this online thing where you can sell, you know, you can get on OnlyFans and sell your body, right? Um, people that tell you that that is somehow empowering are not your friends, right? And a good society, a Christian society, the kind of society that we ought to be striving for is one where the minute somebody turns from that and says, I need help, I can't get out of this, the society immediately says, here are a million ways, right? There have to be routes, there have to be centers. You know, there are, they're not publicized much, but I just gave an example of one, Exodus Cry, right? And we've talked also to Kristen Hawkins about, you know, women that get pregnant out of wedlock and the, the resources that are available to them um, if they, you know, if they realize they don't want an abortion, but they feel like they have to because of, because of financial circumstances, right? Any good conservative, truly conservative ideology means that you have to have this Christian idea of forgiveness at the heart of it. Because if you're going to condemn evil, which you should, you must also welcome repentance. So she goes on to talk about this. She says, to all those who would reproach a repentant prostitute for her sin, she should reply simply that she would sooner offer her body to martyrdom, martyrdom than sin, for God has given her grace to repent and renounce it. So she will never go back to it for anything in the world. And by adopting this course, there is no doubt calling God to her aid, that she can be freed of any debauchery, no matter how great. And if she then finds some bad person whom she cannot resist, immediately she must tell her problem to a magistrate who will take pity on her and she will be resolute. She's saying she's chastising people who would condemn former prostitutes as much as she's chastising prostitutes because she's saying if your attitude has no room for repentance, then you cannot actively condemn people uh, who go into sin. And I, when I say condemn, of course, I don't mean, you know, write off as damned, um, but simply speak truthfully about what it is to go into the worst of sin that we're capable of, right? In order to really talk about sin, you have to talk not about, oh, you did a bad thing, but just like when Christine talks about virtue as treasure, right? You have to talk about vice as trash, right? And this is what conservatives get wrong. We scold people. We say, oh, you ought not to do that. That's, you're so naughty. But what we don't say is, how is that working out for you? Look at how miserable this is making you, right? Because that's the that's the winning argument here. I mean, again, let me compare Christine's attitude to that of the ACLU and lo how far the ACLU has fallen. This used to be an organization in defense of civil liberties. They spoke out for free speech. Now here is an article from the ACLU. Sex work is real work and it's time to treat it that way. Look, guys, these people are not your friends, right? Anybody who tells you that it's somehow empowering, right, to do sex work is real work. What does that mean? Okay, fine. But who said that work is always good, right? Who said that the, the, the being work means being good, right? That's obviously a, an impoverished and, and highly commercialized idea of the human person. Like just because you get money for it, therefore it's empowering, right? That's like the, you know, even the, the most insane free market libertarian wouldn't say that. And so introducing morality into this, which is the one thing that they cannot abide, right, is enables you both to say, you know, this is going to destroy you. Like you're going to be miserable out of this. Um, and to say, and therefore, here are all of the paths that we're going to give you out of it. You have to have both. And in order to have that, you have to have an ideal of womanhood. You have to have ideas about virtue, right? And ideas about what it is to be a woman that do not include degrading yourself in the muck for money, right? This is some, this is one of the biggest crises that we have going on today. And people don't talk about it because it's politically incorrect to say that women are going online and selling their bodies to basically digital pimps on, you know, OnlyFans. Uh, you talk about this and people get very mad. No, it's like, you know, this is women's empowerment. This is women making money. And, you know, again, there need to be off ramps here, but there is simply no quarter to be given to this kind of, of vice. And this is what Christine shows that you don't have to be anti woman. You don't have to hate women to say that women shouldn't degrade themselves. In fact, it, it's out of love for women that you would say that chastity is an important female virtue and a central virtue for women that wish to pursue the true, the good and the beautiful in their own lives, which includes not just 
homemaking, remember, um, and the economic dimensions of that as well as the procreative dimensions of that, but also peacemaking, right, and, and serving all of the crucial roles that Christine shows women serving in a truly civilized world. Let me now return to what we seem to be doing instead of this, right? Because I've talked about the abolition of women. I'm referring here, of course, to C.S. Lewis's great abolition of man, um, which is the idea that technology is going to create men without chests, essentially, because the more that we think that, you know, our, our minds and our reason can solve everything, uh, the more we disconnect ourselves from our animal bodies. Incredibly prophetic set of three speeches that he gave. Um, and now one of the things that we're discovering is that the abolition of man contains and, and necessitates the abolition of of women, because women, as we've been discussing, right, have a unique physical nature and they serve a unique physical role. And now that we've got all this new technology, one of the things that people are starting to suggest we do is use it to liberate women from the burden of being women, right? You see calls for, you know, oh, they're going to be, they're going to be artificial wombs. And you read how people write about this sort of thing, right? And it's exactly in line with the whole, you know, menstruators thing, right? If an artificial womb is created, I'm reading again from the Guardian here. If an artificial womb is created, it will mean that women will be freed from the dangers of pregnancy and create a more equal distribution of labor with women able to work throughout gestation, right? I've said this before on this podcast, but you always have to watch when people talk about, oh, this great technology is going to come and it's inevitable and this is what's going to happen, right? Usually or almost always, they're smuggling in their values about how we should use the technology, right? Because of course, a world of wonders waits before us if we know how to use the tech. But the use of technology to eliminate pregnancy is not a foregone conclusion. That comes from a certain moral vision of the world, an ugly moral vision of the world, I would argue, that would have babies in test tubes and women going off making themselves miserable at a nine to five or more likely an eight to 11, right? Um, this, this idea that, you know, in order to really be free, we not only have to develop all of this technology, but use it to erase the created nature of our bodies um, is going to become more and more important. You're already seeing it in the transgender stuff, right? This this guy, Leah Thomas, who's been, you know, masquerading as a, as a woman's swimmer and just smoking all, he's at Penn University, smoking all of the women's uh, records, right? You've seen J.K. Rowling, author of Harry Potter, becoming this per total persona non grata. They're trying basically to unperson her because she opposes the idea that women should be just like subjected to men in their locker rooms and men in their, you know, in, in their private spaces and all of this stuff. She just recently got into a fight over this gender recognition reform bill. And, you know, she's genuinely a hero. It's amazing. You know, like I, I'm a, I like Harry Potter, but I never thought that I would love JK Rowling uh, until I saw the courage with which she and other women too um, are standing up to say, this is simply not the way forward for us. It doesn't matter what technology you have, right? Use it to do something else, right? Who says that just because we have this technology, what we need to use it to do is un make ourselves and turn ourselves into Lego pieces to be rearranged at will, right? Um, I'll tell you who says this, actually. Martine Rothblatt, another male to female transgender person um, who is spending untold amounts of money and R&D on going in the words, this is Martine Rothblatt's own book, From Transgender to Transhumanism, right? This is where this is all headed. So, I, you know, it's not science fiction. It's a real thing. Rothblatt writes, I am convinced that laws classifying people as either male or female and laws prohibiting people's freedom based on their genitals will become as obsolete in the 21st century as the religious edicts of the Middle Ages seem absurd in America today. Over the next few decades, we will witness the uploading of human minds into software and computer systems and the birth of brand new human minds as information technology. As we see ourselves and our loved ones in these transhuman beings and they make us laugh and cry, we will not hesitate long to recognize their humanity with citizenship and their common cause with us in a new species. Guys, this is why it is so important to recover the entirety of womanhood and to celebrate it, not in the kind of woo woo international woman's day kind of way, but to actually celebrate it as itself, which is the, the created body that makes life and the created soul that lives out the image of God in a distinct and unique way. The, the, the long suffering, the patience, the charity, the emotional intelligence, the intuitions, right? All of these virtues that Christine talks about are still very much alive. And 
though they try to erase them with surgeries and hormones and pills and all sorts of nasty technological innovations, right? Though they try to do this, ultimately all they will do is make us and themselves miserable. And the way to say no is to insist on womanhood, to fight the abolition of women. What you have to do is stop telling women that in order to be perfect, to, in order to be free, in order to be liberated, they have to be men. There's an entire 50% of the world and of the universe, which is female, right? And female in a uniquely feminine way that does not mean wilting away into, onto your fainting couch and does not mean charging out into the boardroom uh, or, uh, you know, into the military, but is actually the womanly grace of creating life and making peace. I hope that you have benefited from this foray into womanhood. Um, and and I, I want to keep talking about this. I'm, I'm not going to keep talking about Christine de Paisan, but I think this is actually a rich and important center of a lot of the threat that we face today. You guys know our pals at the Albertus Magnus Institute. They are running these phenomenal fellowships all online for seeking the true, the good, and the beautiful. And now I'm extremely excited to announce that they are releasing their very first book. It's their inaugural publication, and it's called The Sufferings and Glory of Christ, a Meditation on Holy Week to Ascension. I'm, I know a lot of you guys like to observe the liturgical calendar. I am a big fan of Lenten observances. I think they're profoundly rich and meaningful, some of the best traditions the churches have to offer. Um, and the this it's always important to have a little bit of devotional reading to go along with your Holy Week journey. This is for the leading lead up to Easter and then the stories of, of Christ's uh, resurrection after Easter and meditation, meditating on Christ's resurrection. You don't have to be a dyed in the wool Christian to get something out of this, though, of course, Christians can get something out of it. I am really excited to go through the sufferings and glory of Christ with Father Owen Carroll, who's a wonderful writer. Um, and I'll be commenting and reviewing a little bit about it on, on locals and uh, elsewhere. So if you want to join me in that, I strongly recommend that you go to magnusinstitute.org or Amazon to check out the sufferings and glory of Christ to get in on this journey and to go deeper into the mystery of the resurrection. Let's turn now to a mailbag question on locals. We have this wonderful community on locals where we're talking together about how to live out these ideals and ideas that we that we discuss on the show. Um, by the way, if you're not a VIP yet on locals, I really hope that you will join us. It's a great way to keep the show going. It's a great way to get, uh, you know, to develop a relationship between us that, you know, nobody else can own or censor. It's youngheretics.com forward slash locals. And the you can get a, a month free now with the promo code abolition, A-B-O-L-I-T-I-O-N. Um, and you sign up for the, the yearly subscription and use that promo code. You get a month free. Uh, I'd love to see you there. Now let me take a question from a woman about, you know, how to navigate uh, specific womanhood without becoming a caricature either of the right or of the left. This is from Emily. How can conservative messaging highlight the beauty, joy, and profound importance of motherhood without demeaning women who work? Recently, I've been a bit put off by the implication that women who work, especially in a highly competitive industry, are doing so because they've been sold a bill of goods. Yes, it is absolutely true that fourth wave feminism has told women that the highest ideal is to have goals equal in scope and in kind to their male counterparts. And yes, that is false. There are women who have been fooled. However, there are also women who understand that whilst serving God and family is their most important vocation, work outside of the home is a meaningful component of their lives. Practically speaking, kids are expensive. If one would like to have lots of children, having a lucrative career may assist with the ability to have a big family. Bottom line, I would hate to see Amy Coney Barrett crowded out as a role model for conservatives because her professional success has confined her to the quote unquote widget factory crowd. This is a very well expressed question. And I think that you're on to something. This is why I'm talking about the excesses of conservative rhetoric sometimes in this area, right? Um, to your last point first, right, that kids are expensive. I think that that is actually something that we need to devote policy attention to fixing. Um, Blake Masters is a politician that I've been following so somewhat closely, um, whose whole thing is you should be able to raise a family on one income um, if you want to, right? And that does require some attention to how we have basically prioritized the almighty dollar over all other things. And that's my way into talking about your actual question, right? Which is how do we balance these ideas um, without talking as if all women who work are somehow stooges and flunkies of the evil transhumanist uh, mafia, right? <laughs> and the answer is that Really, what we ought to be doing is first and foremost, revising our idea that 
work is the highest good and money is the highest good altogether. This is something that kind of came into being as we started to build this, you know, post Cold World order world. And as we defined ourselves against the Soviet Union, right, we conservatives especially had this idea, well, you know, the market will solve everything. And that very quickly devolves into this kind of amoral idea that, you know, you, you can make money, you know, making money is what we should allow people to do. And we shouldn't put any restraints on that. And we shouldn't, you know, have any regulations. And because that's just, you know, your moral opinion, man. Um, but that leads you to this thing, this sex work is real work thing, right? It's like, well, okay, maybe it's work, but you know, work is not like an inherently moral thing. Just doing work doesn't mean that you therefore are like getting, uh, you know, that, that therefore you're living your best life or that therefore you're even doing a particularly good thing. And so if we take that away from men and for women and say, you know, your, your money-making endeavor is not the heart of what you are, right? your family making endeavor is much closer to the heart of what you are and your, your work supports that. Right. But, but fatherhood as, just as much as motherhood, right, is a central part of most people's lives. And not everybody is called to it, but those that are right, they are doing what, you know, makes the species literally exist. <laughs> and so that should be at the heart, I think of our, of both our masculine and our feminine ideals. And we can say that women, you know, are, special in that because they have this amazing physical capacity to not only create life, but to nurture it and care for it, right? We can endorse all of those things while also saying that that does not mean, you know, that women just like men might not have <laughs> interests and ideals outside of their, their child rearing life and that support their child rearing life or buttress them. Right. I mean, Amy Coney Barrett is Supreme court justice has obviously raised an incredible family, um, and, and is obviously hugely successful. We could name any number of other, you know, highly successful women, uh, who also have families and seem to be, you know, fulfilled and fulfilling mothers. Um, the the key, I think, right, is about your question of role models, I think, is important, right? Because Amy Coney Barrett might be a, a wonderful example of actualized and realized womanhood without necessarily being the kind of archetypal role model that we would want to hold up, right? I mean, we might need to think about elevating like normal moms a little bit more. Um, because when we start talking, as Christine sometimes says about like, you know, this, this is this wonderful woman who has like gone into battle, you know, um, you start to get this idea that like, this is what women ought to do. And I think we, we can talk about things that women can do and that women are like capable of doing without talking about things that women ought to be focusing on or aspiring to, um, as the center of their lives. But it starts, I think, with demoting work for everybody as the center of, of life. Work is an incredibly important thing. I think that probably for most men, it's, it's more central to their identity than most women, but either way, right. It is not the whole of what it is to be a human, right. Being fruitful and multiplying is the kind of, you know, the, the apogee of what it is to be a human. Building a family is what it is to be a human. Um, and so finding your specific gendered role in that is also part of finding out, you know, what it is to be a man or a woman. None of that precludes the possibility, uh, as I've said several times now throughout this series, right, that you might be working in a different way than your husband or, you know, in a different capacity, even with different aspirations and, and ideals, right? Um, so there are multiple parts to changing this, but it starts with demoting work. Thank you, Emily, for that wonderful question. One more time, join us on Locals at youngheretics.com forward slash locals. The community is growing every day, and it really is a wonderful place to connect. Um, we do live streams every Friday, which I especially like, where we just get to chat. Um, but there's all sorts of stuff on there, youngheretics.com forward slash locals. And thank you for listening. It's so wonderful always to be with you. Love talking to you on this show and uh, can't do it without your support. So please do share the show. Uh, let people know about it, tweet about it, whatever. Give us a five-star review on, on Apple Podcasts um, and check out the Claremont Institute where I work. It's a, a wonderful place for the recovery of the American idea. We put out the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind, um, both of which, especially the American Mind, are interested in some of these ideas about womanhood that we've been discussing. Um, and you can find them both online. The CRB also comes in a print version, or rather a physical copy version. And uh, that's it. I will see you next week for more Truth, Beauty, and the Stuff That Matters.